All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have arrived in Nashville, Tennessee. And the best way to kick off Nashville, Tennessee is with a New Englander. That's right. Uh, it's a college friend, a musician, country musician, Chris Ferraro. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you, bud? Thanks for coming, my guy. Yes, sir. This is so you. exciting for me uh, because you I've known you for a long time. How would you say you know me? Because I don't know if we have the same memory of what we know each other from in school. Um, well, the Greek system. Okay. Number one. Number two, I believe we were in an acting class together. Were we in an acting class together? Nope. Um, but you did, didn't you do theater stuff? Uh, not till after school. That's right. That's right. So how did, I mean, I would say just through the Greek system. Resident front, assistant. Yes. For what was it? For one semester. Yes. And okay. that, that's when I really feel like I got to know you. Yes. Um, because there was like, I don't know, some like after, you know, parties once the, the kids wrapped up or whatever. But you were in a different fraternity. Yes, I was. Uh, ZBT. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know you all too well. No. But I definitely respected your fraternity was very much more, I would say, creative in the sense that there was musicians and you guys were always really good in Greek week and things sure. like that. Lambda. Right? Lambda Chi, yeah. that's right. And, you know, like most of the fraternities, you know, you, we botched our way through all the dances we need to do and everything. <laughs> but you, now you were playing. Tell me about, I want to know about your music career in like were you trying to get into that at the time or like what like where, where did uh how'd you get from there to nashville um in college it was more kind of a hobby um i was writing songs with my buddy kevin sullivan sully you know yep, absolutely. um icon of the uri community yes um <laughs> sully's my best friend he got we started writing songs together in college and then we would perform at you know the coffee shops and we'd perform around, but there really wasn't like a full push for it until after college. My Sully and I started playing shows and started we, we put a band together and we started doing all that. And then my buddy John Cook put me into a cover band that was called The Common Good, which is now the name of my band here, which is Chris Ferrara and The Common Good. Um, and that's how we just that's how it all started. And I really kind of I was I I did acting, you know, I was I did some extras in movies and stuff, and I was a theater minor. And um it really wasn't until after college that I fully pursued music and really started to make a kind of a, a push for it. And then I got hired by a guy, a country artist named Joe Bachman, who was based out of Philly. And oh, I'm sorry. Do I need to go straight here? Uh, you or yeah. Well, you can go. Up? You can go left. Okay. But you can go straight. Which go, one's the better? Which one's the more Tennessee route? Is there, uh, is there one straight. Seen it? Okay. Sorry. I would say straight. So right, when, whenever you Perfect. clear out, they're clear there. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. So no, you're good. So um, Joe Bachman hired me, and I went out. Uh, he got. He was based out of Philly, country artist. But how does he hire you at that point? So I had known him for a couple of years okay. as part of, he was uh, in a cover band. He was playing in the uh, Eastern Seaboard scene from Key West up to Boston. He would go out to Chicago and all that stuff. But he had made a pretty good name for himself, especially in the Philly, mid-Atlantic region. And he wanted to, we were friends through all of that. And we actually met on my 25th birthday because of my brother, uh, my brother who had just gotten home from boot camp. Uh, proud member of the U.S. National Guard, and he uh, Massachusetts National Guard actually, yeah. and uh, and so he introduced us, and from there we just kind of became friends, and I started to watch his career, and I was like, hey man, I really want to do this for a living. Like I really want, I think I can do this, and he called me. I was at work in South Boston, and he said, hey man, your timing's impeccable. My guitar player just quit with no notice. Do you want a job? And I said, yep, sight unseen. Yep, let's do Desperation. it. Desperation yeah, on his end. On his really, on, yeah. yeah, like <laughs> it was just the moment found it. Opportunity. And uh, yeah, man, and uh, that's that's what luck is, right? Is when preparation meets an opportunity and, and it happens. And he said, you're going to have to move to Nashville. And I had never been here. And I said, okay. And so I got hired in September of 2012. I would moved here in March of 2013, so six months later, and I have been here ever since. I have been here for coming up on 11 years. You know, you know how the the Facebook al algorithm works. Sometimes it just won't show you what's going on in someone's life until maybe they hit a critical mass of something people are talking about. And I remember seeing you doing the national anthem at a was it a Pat's Bills game? Yeah. Was that the first one? You've done a couple of them now. Yep, I've done I've done the anthem at Gillette a bunch of times. I've, I've done, 
the anthem at New Era Field in Buffalo as well. I did the anthem at the Garden for the Celtics this past season. What was the what was the most fun or most energetic? The Garden must have been crazy. The Garden was wild. They were playing uh, they were playing the Hornets. So was it the Hornets they were playing? Yeah, I think they were. I think. I think it was the Hornets. No. But you were the star. I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, I, I was performing, and uh, it was cool. It was definitely cool to be inside. That's where I, I learned how to sing the national anthem from watching Rene Rancourt sing before Boston Bruins games. And but I hear it's a terrifying song to sing, just as, as the far the lyrics go. I don't know anything about music. Um, well, the, the, the melody is wide so you got to be able to hit lower notes you got to be able to hit higher notes and i think it's just the pressure that it's the national anthem yeah. i mean if you i know the lyrics to you know thousand songs two thousand songs you know i can i can get up and on stage and sing them and if i know the melody i can get along with it but i think it's the the knowing that this is the national anthem this is the song that everybody is every all eyes are you are on you and you're by yourself. Right. You don't have a band. You don't have backup music unless you're singing at the Super Bowl. And you're probably not going viral unless you fuck it up. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Or or you crush it. Yeah. You either, yeah, yeah. you are either Some better Whitney than Whitney shit. Houston or Chris Stapleton, or you have botched it so bad that everybody's making fun That's of so you and fun. you're like, That's oh so my god, true. watch this guy screw up the lyrics, and you're like, ah. But do they have a circuit where you do like double A baseball stadiums before? You, like no, no. The the um the. Getting to do it at Gillette, I actually, the first place I ever sang, I guess on like a big stage, because I used to do it in high school before basketball games. And, okay. Um, I would do it in, you know, I, I had done it in college for a couple things for like before a basketball game. Um, but. Ryan Center? Yeah, at the Ryan Center, that's right. <laughs> yes. Center, corner center court. There it is. But um, in 2000, oh boy, I'm going to say 16. 2016, I performed, I got asked to sing it at New Era Field in Buffalo because we go up and I've been going up to Buffalo for the last eight, nine years doing uh, my buddy Eric Wood's charity event that raises money for the Oshai Children's Hospital of Buffalo. And they asked to sing the anthem and it was originally going to be Joe who I was on tour with, but he was like, you know what, Chris is launching his solo career, let's let him do it. So I did it there and I wore, I had Patriot socks that I always wore before game day or on game day and... I wore them on the field underneath my pants. Was that the really cold game? It was really cold because at that you had game. Like a scarf going. I was like, that was, I was a, that was it. That was that was in New England because well, I always I was did ready the Christmas to take Eve the game. field with you. Yeah. I was out there watching it with my in-laws, <laughs> yeah. like ready to go. The Christmas Eve game is the one that I would do at Gillette. But so I did it in Buffalo, and then I had posted the picture of me wearing the socks, and it went up the chain through all of the operations at Gillette, and they were like, "We need him to come and sing here. If he's doing this in Buffalo, we need him here." Uh, sorry, Eric. Sorry to the, all of Bill. <laughs> Mafia and everybody. I mean, I still love going up there, and God I love that. people. Love yeah, that's, that's but that opened finish. the door for me to go to Gillette, and then I was at Gillette for six years and did it every Christmas Eve. So it was always a fun thing to What's take my parents to. What's the come down from that? Are you just? I mean, your your pinnacle moment there is to play, sing the national anthem. Then mm -hmm. the game starts. But you're you must. I mean, the amount of adrenaline you must feel in that moment. Oh, it's awesome. It's sixty thousand people listening to you sing. I I love that. I would rather do that than sing right here with just you in the car. Yeah. Like, I'd rather do that i would want to go get like a sausage and a beer and, and let people know that i was a singer but guys <laughs> i just that was me remember that guy that was me there are a couple times i would wear like i had either red pants on or i was wearing a certain outfit that if people saw it they would be like, oh that was the guy who sang the anthem and that's not so cool for me that's more cool for like my dad oh, yeah. for me to walk around with my dad or with my mom and for them to see that type of recognition and that type of not accolade, but that type of, you know, attention. They love that. They well, love to you know, see that. It's very hard for parents and family because family just wants to brag about their kid. Sure. And like my mom, she, she, I was talking to her the other day and she was like, I just wanted to say you were doing well on Wall Street or whatever, but that's not what I was doing. I was <laughs> making minimum wage, you know, doing all this stuff. Sure. And it's like, they don't necessarily know how to say, my, my son's trying to do this or he's, a, you know, he's pursuing it. You know, like sure. it's very hard to put a, but then when you do the national anthem at Gillette, that's like a pinnacle moment. So sure. when was, when was it like real for your parents that you were like, okay, I'm, he's, my son's a professional recorder artist oh that's a good question probably the anthems probably being asked back I always say it's not about getting asked to do something it's about getting asked back that means you did a really good job and that's in anything that's that could be mowing lawns that could dating. be sing, dating you know yeah, you're right. you get the call back. right you get the call back and then you get married right and then you get you, know? you can lie their way into a first date that's, that's right um 
No, I, I would say probably that. I would say it was probably when those that moment kind of happened when it was, you know, hey, oh my God, he's getting ass back. And then I get to bring them to it. Um, maybe when they came out and saw me play my first, not headline, I was opening for Sister Hazel in Chicago, a sold out House of Blues in Chicago, and they came out to that show. Um, you guys crush. I want to I wanna have an anecdotal first person witness here. You got to My wife and I... Uh, a fiance at the time we're driving back from Cincinnati to Los Angeles after Christmas turns out you were the last concert I went to before the pandemic we had mm. no idea what was about to come and you were playing in Memphis and we were like I don't know what you're gonna you know you're gonna have your band I don't know what's gonna be going on mm. you guys were so tight so professional so you're you had like big band vibes trumpet oh, yeah. saxophones keys you guys i think you had a what's the what's the key you had a keytar yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm watching you guys going man and then there was i've, t- I've told this story before there was one moment where you like sh- i'm in the front row there's one moment you like shouted me out and i'm like oh i'm the chick i'm the chick in the front <laughs> row who's like woo because i'm telling my wife yeah i went to college with him she doesn't know and i'm like that's my name yeah. <laughs> he said me i told you um, i know him i told you that's and funny. we were just randomly passing through, had no idea we'd really be there that night. So it was really special. But I was I was inspired by how, like, I, tight is the only word I can say, but I was inspired by how tight your act was. From your first song, grab your first note, you guys grabbed the attention of the entire room and let, let you know, I don't know, a thousand or so, maybe more people in there know, all right, the party starts now. Mm. And that's got to be extremely hard, especially when you're performing in, in places where everyone's performing. Everyone's fantastic in Nashville sure. and, and all that. So how do you, I mean, the whole idea of like the 10,000 hours is something people talk about a lot. No but doubt. I was made witness in that moment to it to be like, dang, the last time I saw you perform, other than on uh, you know my TV screen, mm-hmm. was, was yeah, your band um, at maybe one of the college gigs or, uh, you know, one of those sure. local Providence. Long time ago. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, are you able to... to like see the difference or is it so minimal so lo- over such a long period of time and and also how much mm. how much practicing is going in or is it just tons of gigs uh tons of gigs number one i mean rehearsals come when they're needed um especially if i'm going to add my songs to the set i want to make sure those are tight i tell the guys i don't care if you screw up country girl shake it for me or you know can't stop the feeling by just like i don't i don't care if you screw those up make sure that you know my songs because well, my songs don't... are the ones that don't Matt. screw up, uh, screw up Dolly Parton. We learned this. Yes, week. don't do that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but yeah, poor El King. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, I would say, I would say absolutely. I recognize the difference between then and now. Uh, you're gonna want to get in the left lane here. I'm taking Just, this left. Uh, no, this middle lane here. Okay. You're gonna go left at the. Uh, I think the next Donaldson. Line. Yes, on Donaldson gotcha. Pike. Yep. Yeah, just follow this. Um, yeah, man, I, I absolutely have know the difference, especially when people come through that haven't seen it like you. Like, when you ask that question, I would say, yes, you are going to notice an absolute difference between what you remember me as or where the last time you saw me as in, in comparison to where I am now. The show, I've got a saxophone and a trombone. There's choreography through the whole show. There's there's the guitar. There's keys. There's drums. All of the guys in my band, slam they are just they are so very very talented and versatile they can play any genre and what's really cool is that we when we play together we take these songs that like you said everybody in nashville is really good and they are you go to every single bar you're gonna see talented people it's it's, so it's how do you stand out and we stand out by doing our own arrangements of them by having the horns by having the choreography by having the high energy in your face, getting people to sing along, shouting people out from stage, you know, making people, we're, we're in the business of creating moments and creating and memories. that's not something you can just study for. Like, you, that's something you feel in the moment. Yeah, you... I mean, with, yeah. like, stand-up, it's like, if you get heckled, you might not have a response to that heckle, but the next show you're going to have a response because mm-hmm. you thought about it the whole way home. 100%. And you're providing so many variables to your formula that you're, you're just going to be ready to... I always appreciate when you see someone break a string or lose, and you just see the, you see the show keep going on. Mm-hmm. And that's the difference between, like... I almost want to call it, in my experience, like a blue-collar musician, someone who's done it for a long time versus mm. in what I think, like, pop culture pop music for, to me it's like they're always looking for like 
the next 16 year old who they can put in clothes and, sure. and like has a good voice. But I think the true performance ship that I see as just like a random fan in Nashville is like people that have done it for a long time. Sure. Well, and that's the 10,000 hours that you said, right? You put in all this work to get good at it, to get to the point where you are talented enough to be able to play any song that you want in any moment. And I, I don't write set lists. I call songs. So oh, I, yeah? I, yeah. So oh, I, that's so fun. I yeah. have, you know, you I've got, got the sheet like the NFL quarterback. Basically, yeah. Like I'm getting the phone <laughs> in from the, oh no, okay, we got to go. We got to audible. And like audibles happen. Like it's, you know, we, I could be in the middle of a song and I've done this plenty of times where I've gone a verse and a chorus and I'm like, you know what? This song is not hitting. And I thought it was going to, this was a swing and a miss. I'm going to stop and I'm going to play something else. And you could be, you could get, you know, fumble through that, or you could just say it over the microphone. You know what? I'm going to change it because I don't see y'all singing this. So I'm going to do something everybody can sing along to. And it's a lot of that. And I like to read the crowd. I am, I read the crowd. That's when I call the songs that go in the moment for it. And that's so funny because that's like a, a stand up comedian. You know, you might have a six minute bit. And it's like, if you didn't like the, the first minute, you're not going to like the yeah, next one. Yeah, right. Well, here Bam. we are, guys. Let's just get yeah. through it together. That but, was the friendly part, and you didn't like it. Yeah. So we're going to go move on. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's just, it's like you said, that 10,000 hours of I've put, I've played. I've played a lot of shows, man. I've played a lot of shows. I've toured all over the country. Now, um, do you get bitter at all if audiences want to hear the covers and not the originals? Like, how do you how do you put them in play in the in the proper place <laughs> to succeed? Because an original really just needs to be jammed down someone's throat long enough so that they can remember the lyrics or the hook or whatever, and yep. then and then you get that dopamine rush when you know a song. Mm-hmm. So it's like most not a, you know not everyone was partying in the USA, but now we know it, and it's just like sure. you go for it. I think a lot of that is it's very easy to get bitter about it if you're, and then uh, then you get self conscious about it because you're like oh my songs aren't good enough. But I just I mean I say to my guys all the time no matter what. I just want to perform. I want to entertain people. So if it's my songs, amazing. That's the goal. The goal is for everybody to know the words to my songs. If they don't and they never learn the words to my songs, then I know the songs that they are going to like and I can make a career out of performing for people and entertaining them and being the person that they call when they want to have a good time. Um, and it's also easy to get bitter when you see, like you said, those the 16-year-old, they're going to dress them up and just put them out and they're, they're just this piece of their cheeseburger they're a fast food cheeseburger yeah. that satisfy the craving here and then we're full and then we're going to get the America next one America loves their fast food too. they love it man but it is you know it's being able to keep the head above be like listen as long as I'm performing as long as I'm entertaining as long as I'm the guy that gets the phone call because I've had it where you know they've I've played events where they've oh we got this artist and this artist and this artist and oh uh, the party wasn't all that fun like we didn't really know a lot of their songs and then we called you and we want you to come back because you played some of your songs but you also played a lot of songs that everybody enjoyed and it was a party in here and that's and that's what we do we are a high energy in your face loud fun time and it's a feel good show always now when do you when did the snowball uh, reach the sort of critical mass where it got to that because you know like a lot of times you have to work you know that tightness doesn't just come right away so like like did you did you feel that moment where you kind of hit that flow um i would say it was when i got the phone call to play at justin timberlake's club um i had been pumping away at this for a few i mean i've been out on the road for many years traveling touring i was doing my own thing for about three years covid happened and there was no like there was no end in sight for covid so i didn't know what was going to happen i thought i was going to end up having to move home um and my wife was like it's not time to go home yet it's not time to go home yet uh you know we were she was my fiance we were supposed to get married in 2020 but we had to delay it but she was like it's not time to go home yet and my manager also it's not time it's not time get through this keep your head down get through this and when the doors open back up you're going to be the first call. And did you mean, did you think you go home for good? Mm-hmm. Like that's where they Yeah. I was, well, cause it's, it, and what does go home for good mean? Uh, is that more symbolic? Like we're going to give up the, the pursuit in Nashville and just be like a new England guy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cause it was, you know, it was, you know, everybody know it was COVID. Everything shut down. There were no, my job is to put as many people in a space as possible. Yeah. Like if you, if there's no room for you to move, 
like I mean, obviously that's a fire hazard, but like <laughs> as 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 if I can jam the energy in that room when you have all these people packed in a room, you're at capacity. That's my goal. My job is to create that moment, and if I can do that, then I am a very successful entertainer. Well, it's the same thing. I always said. I, I heard someone say this that the best place to do stand up comedy is the worst place for a fire. It's mm. where it's dark, mm. it's tightly packed, it's yep. back rooms at New York clubs, or yeah, it's like that's that's where the best energy is created because you're like you're like kind of like squishing everybody mm-hmm. to into the same rhythm yep. both like physically but also like it's like almost spiritually to yes. a point when everyone's on the same rhythm of a song mm-hmm. everyone's hearts beating together you're aligned and you guys are yeah. so I'm not kidding so tight with your material and with your performance that it is just like you know people like bad music <laughs> you know what I mean right. so when you guys when you guys took the stage I was gonna like you guys no matter what I was like oh shit man yeah, I appreciate it I, I, I literally was like oh I'm not working hard I literally felt not in a not in like a n- negative way but I literally was like I need to rise my game up because there are people like Chris that are working so dang hard and really like you, the stages that you're on are indicative of of whatever this, these steps were on the way to get there mm. like people think um, in, uh, which, what time do you have to be there just keep going straight I got okay. a little bit of time just keep I'll going straight and we'll, and we'll do a loop around great so I um, but yeah you know when you see someone talented hit you see oh that person's got so much talent they're a savant they're this or that and they don't Same get to there. see you yeah. perform in those moments where you're you're getting this just stay in this on the left don't just stay right here yeah and you, just go straight you don't they don't get to see you performing at those college bars and all of the things that you do to get up to that level and I think some people just think that they can't and again it takes an, 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 an incredible amount of talent to begin with but harnessing that fire and keeping it going might be the hardest part. Mm. So like when where, when did your wife come into the picture? How, how long has she been with you? Uh, she's been with me for the whole ride. She was with me when I was playing dingy clubs in Boston, when I was playing bars, acoustic, just trying to figure it all out. She was with me when I moved to Nashville. We did long distance for four years. Um, wow. She's been with me the whole ride. and. I am very lucky to have someone in my corner. There's a lot of people, uh, there's a lot, like it, when you get into a relationship with a, certainly a musician or a touring musician, there's the phase one is, oh my God, he or she is a rock star. Oh my God, I love what they do. This is so cool. I get to go do these cool things. And then it comes to the next point, like, okay, well, I'm not going to go to every show. And I don't, like, I get it. Like, it's cool. Like, da, 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 all the, 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 the novelty of it is worn off. And then the final step is, okay, when are, um, when are you going to stop going on? I miss you. Like, when are you going to stop doing this so that you can be home and we can have our family and we can do all the things that we're, that we're doing. And I am very thankful that my wife has, she's probably lived in, in number two for a long time, uh, of the, I'm not going to go to all your shows. I know the songs that you play. I know your music. I love, you know, I love that this is what you do, but you can go, that's your thing. I have my, whatever. And it's a very, it's a beautiful relationship that we have, and she understands that this is this is my job. We're in the car right now, taking me to the airport to fly to Dallas to go play an event in Dallas. And I and this, but this is what my job is. And my daughter will know this is what Daddy does for work. Daddy travels or Daddy plays in town, but sometimes Daddy hits the road and goes. And uh, the goal is to be out on tour, and like we said, having my songs be what everybody knows, and um, you know, either be out opening for somebody or be out headlining and doing my own thing and and pushing that but however the chips fall like this is this is what my job is until I can no longer sing or people no longer enjoy my show this is what I do and I'm I've got a great band and I've put a lot like we've been talking I've put a lot of work into it to be able to be have it be a career and the persistence that we that you mentioned is that is just what if you're good enough I, you know, people say, when are you going to make it? I, listen, I make it every single day. Yeah. My, I wake up every single day. I, I made a promise to myself in 2012 that I would be a full-time musician for the rest of my life. That's what I was going to do. Wow. And I am very proud of it and thankful that I have been able to have the camp that I have and have the talent around me and have the, the skill set to be able to call it a career and to be able to have been doing it for coming up on 11 years and under my own business for the last, I launched in 2018 really, was like when I first started really playing out on my own, so six years of seven years, uh, if you go the year before that, of it being my business and my job and it's and it's my career. And so it's, 
it's a level of professionalism. And I try to surround myself with people of the like so that I can learn from them or be inspired by them and yeah, take you it know, to the next level. I heard, a, um, I heard a saying that you don't pay me to perform, you pay me to fly. Mm. Or get to wherever I'm mm-hmm. performing. Like everyone, you the, say it all the time. Yeah, you you. I mean, who doesn't love the performance? The rush? The fun part. That's a fun. I'll part. do that for free. Yeah, I do it for free every single it's time. It's saying goodbye, and I have you know was witness just now. You have to say to, goodbye to your daughter, and I and I you know having my wife pregnant. I'm like, oh, this is gonna be tough when I have a kid knocking on the glass. Dad, dad, yep. don't go. <laughs> You're like, yep. Oh man. So what's that like? I mean, obviously it's it's um not quite like leading a double life, but you you're a family man, and mm. then you also have this. Uh, thing you have to feed. Um, yeah. Has it changed being a father, or how, like, like, sure. like, oh bra- my God, yeah. brace me for what's coming in my. Oh life. yeah. Well, uh, I, when my daughter was born, I mean, when I, I would listen to her, I would listen to her in my wife's stomach. I would listen, to, put my ear up to her. I would try to talk to her, and when she was born, it was as if the wiring in my brain changed. Because it was every, like, you know, my life has been about me and it's been about me and my wife. And it is no longer about us. It is about our daughter. And it is about making sure that she stays alive. That is a massive, uh, it's not a burden. It is a, it is a, God, it's a privilege. But it is, you know, that is a, you have to keep this child alive forever. For, <laughs> forever. As long as you're alive on the earth, you got to keep this thing alive. And it's, the, like I said, the wiring changed. It was now, like, now it, it, it changed how I operated in my business where it was, you know, I used to let my heart get in the way. I used to let, you know, oh man, I'll give him another shot. I'll give him another shot. Uh, you know, this, this isn't working out, but maybe it'll come around. This didn't happen. Da, da, da. Like now, if you're not bringing a game to the table, then you are keeping, potentially keeping food out of my daughter's mouth. Right. And I'll, and I'll kill you for that. Like, you're that's, speaking, you're speaking now as the head of the family. Yep. And someone's not just wasting your time; they're they're now wasting your family's yeah. time. Yeah, and you don't waste. I mean, you can try to waste my time, <laughs> but if you waste, if you're wasting my wife's time, if you're wasting my daughter's time, I don't. I got no time for you because wow. because I could be. I could. What I'm out doing, if what I'm out doing is not bringing value to my back home to my family, well, I could just be at home with my family. Why wouldn't I I get, and I'm very fortunate. My wife is a mental health counselor, music therapist. So we're a very musical family. Um, But during the week, if I'm not in the studio recording or if I'm not attending a show or performing, then I'm at home with my daughter. I'm very lucky and I don't take it for granted at all that I get to be a hands-on, at-home dad to my daughter, especially in these crucial critical first years of her life now you had this song i don't want to butcher the title but it was about tomorrow like i'll tell you today tomorrow today tomorrow Mm -hmm. i'll hear about today tomorrow yeah that's can you tell me one of those lyrics because that's i was just listening to that in what in you you sing of your dad Mm -hmm. in in how you you know you 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 don't always get to maybe say good night to your kid but you'll tell i'll tell you about today tomorrow but Mm -hmm. it's a real beautiful uh lyric and it and it really kind of speaks to the fact that people live different lives now mm-hmm. and it's not like just your nine to five and and you know so like what what was the inspiration of that song was it your child or was it your father uh so i wrote that song with um, my buddy scott buchanan and johnny mcguire and we all kind of grew up the same way we grew up you met you had mentioned blue collar musician that blue collar performer that kind of thing that's how i grew up i grew up blue collar i was you know raised in suburbs of boston and uh sharon massachusetts and that's pretty blue collar boston it's it's blue collar, man. Especially the way I grew up. My dad, he uh, he owned his own dry cleaning business. My mom worked for the dry cleaning business. Um, so my mom was also a teacher, a special education teacher. Um, but it was just a very blue collar household. My we were raised and taught my to you work hard for what you believe in and and what you want to do. And you you know you put your your family on your back and you and you you don't complain about it. You just do it. And it's um, and so we were. Like I said, me and the, the other guys were raised very similar, and the lyric had come up. I think it was, I can't remember if it was my lyric or if it was, um, it was one of the guys. But the lyric was, um, "You'll be asleep when I get home, so I'll hear about today tomorrow." And the whole thing was, you know, my dad would leave before the sun came up, and he would come home after the sun had gone down because he was the owner of the business. He was. It was his thing the whole way, and uh, if something went wrong, he was there. He was at it, and there were a lot of times where he would come home and he would have to eat 
you know, a meal out of the fridge. You'd have to, you know, my mom would make him a plate from dinner and put saran wrap over it and then he'd microwave it for dinner and that's what he would get to have and a lot of long hours for him and I would get to see him for like baseball practice or yeah. see him for that kind of soccer practice or whatever when I was little. Um, but I just remember him being, you know, he was so busy all the time and um, then you know, you grow up and you try not to be like your parents in certain in certain ways, but in a lot of ways you end up being exactly like them. Well, my hustle is now, I keep hitting this microphone, my hustle is now traveling and touring and playing music, much like a, a traveling salesman um, or somebody, you know, who has to go to conferences and stuff like that or somebody who works overnight, nurses and doctors and, you know, these people who have, have to work overnights and don't get to put their kids to bed and don't get to what, you know, all that kind of stuff. So there were many times where I would say to my girlfriend, you know, hey, I don't, I don't have a chance to talk to you tonight. Like, I'll talk to you tomorrow. I'll hear about everything tomorrow. I'm t I, today was too busy. Or, you know, now I leave, you know, we, I leave, I got to say bye to my daughter. And I say, okay, I'll see you Sunday. That's, I mean, that's two days away. Yeah. So I'm going to miss all of Saturday with her. And that's a long time for her. Uh, that's you know, a long time that's for her. Long even if she's little, I don't even think she truly realizes it yet or it's uh or it hasn't all clicked or anything like that for her yet. It probably will in the next couple of years. Um, and if I'm lucky, my career will continue to go and hopefully be even more successful then. But it's just, it's, you know, that that's what that song was about. So it, it, it ended up being about my dad and my childhood and my growing up. And then it also ended up being about me and, and, and my life and my relationship and my, my daughter's childhood. And it just, when I get to play that song out and play it for people, I, it always resonates with at least one person. Oh my gosh. It. I mean, I'm getting emotional thinking about it yeah. because we've all got parents and they're not always exactly what maybe we wanted i always said like i'm gonna mess my kid up one way or another but i'm mm. gonna try not to like you know we're just not always gonna be the thing that everyone needs we're just gonna download all of our <laughs> yeah. past trauma and all of our things onto them yeah but <laughs> man really it, you know the the biggest fear i would ever have is not being authentically me mm. and therefore being some form of bitter and then my kid gets a shelled out version of me so what you're going to really teach your daughter in one way or another is to pursue authenticity and passion mm. and honestly nothing else matters no nope. you've you know you probably know this sometimes your happiest time is when you're you know sleeping on someone else's futon while you're while you're kind of trying to make the dream work sure. and no amount of lottery ticket can change that it really can it can make some things a lot easier yeah for sure yeah it there can buy a music studio but it's not going to give you the hustle to actually use to it. use it sure yeah but when you talk about you know the kids you know kids are going to be living a different life i really look fondly on our college experience we were really one of the last years like we we had cell phones but they were really just used to set up plans for the night mm -hmm. that was it that's it you I, I don't even think we had unlimited texting it was like you know you i know i didn't yeah, i certainly didn't have unlimited texting. you got a certain amount you, you know if you were hitting on someone you a couple flirty things that's it mm -hmm. no conversations just planning and it's just a different world out there like have you do you have screen rules with your daughter as far as how much time you guys allow her to be on it, or like, uh, how do you even how do you even cope with the? Well, she's so little. She's so my. She's she's not even two yet. You know, she's she's what is it? She'll be twenty, one month. She's a year and a half, right? So she's she's still so little. We don't. We try not. To, we try ourselves to not be on our phones. Yeah. Now my wife, when she's working during the day, she was t we were talking last night. She was like, you know how much screen time I've had today? And I'm like, I don't know. She's like, I had like an hour and a half of screen time today because she was so busy at work and she was never was on her phone or whatever. And meanwhile, you flip over to me and my life has to be on social yeah. media, interacting with people, posting things and, you know, keeping everybody up to, that's because that's what the so fans hard to do the, to, to, to do the content you need to do on social media versus getting sucked into someone else's thing. Yes. You know, I just bought like a, a cheap <laughs> yeah. Amazon tablet fire because I was like, I need to be able to write without the apps popping up on my phone. Mm. And I use a Google Keep, which goes to my phone so I can be before a gig and look at my notes. Yep. And it goes to my laptop. But uh, when I'm in that, that Amazon tablet, which I just started using this week, only lets me do that. Mm, that's, and that's cool. That 80 bucks. I was like, I need this. I got a million different notepads and this. It blocks everything else up. Nothing. I mean, I got that's no great. other things. And that's it. And because I don't have, I, I'm like almost, I'm aware that I'm powerless to what the phone can suck me away from mm. Ooh, and it yeah. can be so tough because i live off of instant dopamine like my youtube channel makes its money by it by noon every day mm. and writing a bit doesn't do that so i've i've 
it's it's almost hard to be aware of like what I'm doing right now isn't going to pay off tonight. Mm. But whenever like a comic has a new joke hit, that's the best feeling in the world. Sure. And then the more you do that joke, the the less dopamine you get from it because you know it's going to do well. Sure. And it's kind of just that weird game you have to play with with like the reward of new and creative and also the tried and true sure. of what's going to rock the house and get me booked again sure. to provide me the chance to sneak in a new song or yeah. whatever. So it's the same with music. It's like we have we close our show almost every single show we close with Mr. Brightside by the Killers Great. because it just it crushes. It's a it's a home run 100% of the time. <laughs> and there's like it's it is that it's like putting, you know, Whoever the most clutch, it's like putting Ken Griffey Jr. at bat. Yeah. And right when like, that, that initial was it piano, whatever it is, yeah. the, or guitar, that initial kind of like, uh, yeah. everyone knows that sound. That's like, all right, this is yeah. the song. They know it, and that's yeah. like, I mean, that's how you know you have a hit is when you just start playing the first few notes. Like, I mean, like uh, Backstreet Boys, I want it that way. Yeah. That opening lick comes, and everyone goes, ah, <laughs> don't stop believing, dum 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 dum. dum. Yeah. Everybody, oh my god, <laughs> and people lose their minds for it. And so it's um. You know, there is that. There is that, you know, do you do you try new stuff? Well, you have to try new stuff. That's how you evolve. That's how you broaden your own horizons and broaden your own, your strengths as far as musician, as far as comedian, whatever. And you, you know, you just, you have to, but you have to try it and you have to put it out there. But again, there's like the ones that win every single time, the ones that hit and you know. Yeah, that's like feeding be. the beast. It's like, all right. And then, you know, the same with comedy, all right, open strong. I mean, unless it's like a bar place where you just want to throw shit at the wall. Sure. But even then, if you're trying to throw shit at the wall, at least have the audience respect you. I always say there's the, is competence and likability. Those are like the two trademarks mm. that really get you anywhere because mm. you got to be likable unless you, your competence is through the roof where you're like a, the most supreme musician in the world. You can be an asshole. But in most cases, <laughs> you've got to be likable because they're just going to be like, you know what, there's a million other people that are great at what they do. Sure. And so there's that there's that balance of sustaining yourself in the industry. Sure. Well, I say this the whole time. I've been saying it my entire career, even back when I was in Boston. It was me and Sully would always say it. It was, you know, you want to be the most liked person in the room. When you walk in the room, you want people to love that you're there. You want people to love. That's how you're going to get invited back. That's the same thing as being a touring musician. If you are, you could be a 10 talent and a five hang and you're not going to get the call because nobody wants to hang out with you. Nobody wants you on the road. Nobody wants to spend yeah, you gotta, you hours spend and hours. Spend hours to drive. To yeah, the place. dude. I don't want to be around somebody who's a mope. Some I don't want to be around somebody who's who is negative all the time or somebody who makes jokes that I don't like or, yeah. or like you know things of that nature. Like you could be a ten hang and a seven talent, and I'll take you one hundred percent of the time over the ten talent five hang. Absolutely. Because it's it, that's you. You got to be likable. You got to you got to go into these rooms and people need to like you. People need to enjoy your presence and then your show has to be good it has to be likable it has to be it's the whole thing man I'm, I'm in the job of trying to be the most popular kid in, in class that's what my job is is to I want every if the more people that like me the better off I'm doing yeah also, you know, alternate, if there's a lot of people who don't like me, sometimes that means you're doing a really, really good job. Yeah. Everybody got to have haters, right? I mean, what kind of, is there, I mean, I've only, I've literally watched the show Nashville and that's all I know. And I'm sure, and it's obviously a scripted, fictitious show, <laughs> but there's got to be a lot of, a lot of um, everyone sort of knows each other. Sure. If you've done it long enough, is there a lot of that sort of, sure. uh, uh, sort of talking? community? Well, there's a community in Nashville. There's community. There's a lot of people in the city that get along that that we all do the same thing and so you all in I've never I mean I've been to LA but I never have tried to do LA right I've never I was I wanted to be an actor when I was in college and I've had dreams of aspirations of going to LA I had never even thought of Nashville as a reality for me I didn't even like hardly knew where it was on a map but um there's a sense of community here, and it's not cutthroat, and it's everybody wants everybody to succeed. The people who don't, the people who are bitter, the people who are, who just get down about it and and are and try to cut corners and try to undercut people, they either see themselves out of the city, or people just don't associate with them. Yes, yeah, scarcity and, mentality. And sometimes people win that way, but in Nashville. There's a community here because you never know. I could sit down and write a song with you today. I don't know what that's going to happen. You could meet somebody huge tomorrow and that then pitch them that song. That song gets cut and your life changes. You get a pub deal from it. You get whatever. So it's like 
it, there is a sense of selflessness that goes into it that you, I'm not better than you, or I might be better than you, like whatever, but we're all on the same page. We're all on yeah. the same team here. Everybody's trying to make it. And so it doesn't make sense for me. Like if I would rather people look up to me than, than look down on me, like in a, oh, he's a dick. That's the other, I say all the time, always have a good butt. Always have a good butt, whether in life or in, you know, whether in your physical or in your personal. You don't want people to say, oh, he was had a great show, but he was a dick. You don't want people to say, oh, my God, I really enjoyed hanging out with him. But did you hear all that kind of stuff that he was saying or did you, did you like whatever? You don't have a bad butt because that's what people remember. Yeah. People, they, they're, they're going to have the good thing to say, but then they're going to have this sour taste in their mouth because of because of this. And so it's always... Just be a good person. It's not hard to be a good person. It's not hard to say please and thank you. It's not hard to hold the door so to smile at people. I and think creativity yeah. in some of these positions, and just let me know Southwest. when to stop here. All the Southwest. way, all the way uh, Oh, you got those free check bags, my Ooh, guy. Yes, I see what's up. Uh, he knows he's traveling. Let's go. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I think a lot of people get anxiety with performance and you know and it and it can turn into this rageful thing and in the bitterness and you've been doing you know when you've been doing things so long so i do see i do see the route to like a very bitter person but you're right you just have to fight that because you never know what tomorrow is going to bring and man i mean selfishly just to wrap us up here selfishly i was i'm really excited we were able to chat today because i've been here for four days man and i was like oh man i gotta talk to chris like you you've been here for a bit and it does seem like a type of town that's not too big where you're not known and and all that so yeah man i uh, i really appreciate well, it well you've been here for four days and i've already seen you i know other people who have been here for years and i haven't seen them so well, it's, i made i made uh you I made, made it a priority and i appreciate it yeah it's man great to catch up and great to chat with you and thanks to everybody for watching and listening and i'll post your links and everything below go support my guy here and i can't wait to see you on even a bigger stage chris ferrara i am chris ferrara there it Check is it out. let's go let's do it all right let me help you out. yeah that's great <laughs>